second. I got a lot of help being me. Being my man, he got me on Twitter. He got me on Periscope. He got me on a bunch of stuff that I don't even know how to get on on my phone, but he got me there. So you can follow me on Twitter. I don't know how you follow me, but I am on Twitter. So follow me on Twitter, because what I'm doing is I'm sending out messages on Twitter, on Periscope, and anytime I run into a problem I don't know, Ben takes care of it. And, and I know John Halls, he's, he's an humble man, but I need John Halls to stand up in the back here. Please, John, wife, make it. She can put it on you if you don't. He has been doing such a great job with our YouTube and our media. I mean, just bless. I'm blessed, and I never really do feel like uh, that I deserve you guys. That's how much I think of y'all. Uh, there's not a day in my life, that even on tough days, every now and then you may have a tough day, I thank God for you, my church family. Y'all are the people that, that I love, the people that I look to, and I thank God for each and every one of you. And uh, Nikki Grippiotis had a great idea, and i got to get up with Lawrence Hayes on this. This Friday, we are having our Tazewell Richlands game. And I, I want to say this because I got some Tazewell folk, I got Richlands folk, I got all kind of folk. It is a game. It's a game. You don't hate people over a game. You know what I'm saying? And the, the last thing we need is a community divided because of a game. And it's a game. What I love about my, the, the, the Richlands High School football team is they love the players on the other side. After the Bluefield game, they, I watched them. They walked up to one of their uh, former players that, that went to Bluefield, great kid, and they were all hugging him. It was like a family reunion. The caliber of the young men that are on the Townsville football team, the Richlands football team, great young men. They need us to be great adults. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to we'll get up with Lawrence Hayes and get up with Coach Mance. We're going to figure out how to do this. We're going to meet on the field before the game, the parents and people that want to pray. And we're going to pray. And we're going to show unity. And we're going to show that you can knock the snot out of each other on the football field and love each other when the game's over. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 16. Verses 22 and 23. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. Saul said, I like this boy. I love this boy, and I need him because I'm hurting. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp, and he played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. Notice that he was tormented in his mind, but when he got the presence of the anointing of David, that evil spirit had to go. Now I want you to go to chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Not one time, but two times. I want to preach a little while from the subject of when your assignment attacks. What do you do when the thing you were assigned to help attacks you? When your assignment attacks attacks. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, I want you to see this because this is how we're going to start today. Cast not away therefore your confidence. Everybody say confidence. Amen. Which hath a great recompense of reward. One of the most powerful things about a believer is their confidence in God and their confidence that God can use them. Some of the most attractive people in life are people that are confident. I have seen people that were beautiful outwardly, but because they had no inward confidence, they were alone and they were isolated. And I have seen other people that at the moment you meet them, the confidence they possess is a magnet that draws people to them. One of the most powerful things a believer possesses is confidence in his God and confidence in who his God made him to be. A, a confident believer can storm hell. A confident believer can stand up before a crowd and proclaim the word of the Lord. A confident believer can lay hands on sick people and believe that they actually will get better. A confident believer, it's not arrogance, it is what the blood of Jesus was shed for, that you might
might feel good about God and good about yourself. One of the most powerful things you have is your confidence in God. And your confidence in who God made you to be. You look at every person that is powerful and there is a level of confidence that they have on the inside of them. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Paul never denied who he was. But he said, I understand that I'm only that way by the grace of God. There's nothing wrong with you feeling good about yourself as long as you give God the glory for it. If I'm right about it, somebody give him a hand clap of praise. The enemy hates a confident believer. He hates it when you're confident in what God called you to do, in what God told you to do. All through the scripture you see the enemy trying to attack the confidence of the believer. The, the confidence of the men and women of God. He tried to attack their confidence in Egypt that God would ever bring them out. He tried to attack the confidence of Joseph that his dreams would ever come to pass. He tried to uh, attack the confidence of all the Old Testament prophets that what they were saying and proclaiming would ever come to be. And I'm preaching to people today that are in a season that your confidence has been attacked. I've seen people that when they go through the battle and they go through the struggle, it's like the enemy stripping away little by little and bit by bit their confidence because there's one thing the enemy's not permitted to touch on Pastor Joe Horn and that's the gift and the calling of God that is on him. God said my gifts and my calling, they are irrevocable. In other words, God said I ain't never going to change my mind about you and there ain't nothing you can do about it. I wish somebody could. Mama might change her mind. The media might change their mind. There is a gift and there's a calling with Mary Epster's name on it. And when my confidence is in God and who God called me to be, I can walk in that gift. And I can walk in that calling. And the devil hates it because he knows God has not permitted him to ever strip me of my gift and my calling. No matter what, that gift and that calling is there. So if the enemy says, no matter what I do, no matter what valley you go through, I can't get God to change his mind about you. Your gift and your calling will always be there for you. When the enemy sees that he can't touch that, he says, if I can't touch that, I'll touch you. If I can get you to lose confidence in what God told you. If I can get you to lose confidence in that thing God put in your spirit all those years ago. If I can get you to lose confidence, uh, then uh, your gift and calling will be there. But you'll never walk in it, Jennifer. You'll never accomplish it, Jamie. Because if I lose my confidence, then I refuse to do what God called me to do. There will always be the voice of the enemy somewhere in the background trying to strip you of your confidence. You'll believe him for a miracle. And his voice in the background will remind you of five people you know that would believe him for that same miracle and it didn't happen. Let me know if I'm in the right house today. You'll believe in God for something good. And that voice will be there trying to talk you out of your confidence. Many of you under the sound of my voice today, you're in a war. It's like a jet airplane without fuel sitting on the runway. All that potential and no power to rise above the circumstances. All the potential that lies in you, David looked in that mirror and he said, I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. But David realized all through his life it was the enemy that tried to strip him of his confidence. I feel the preach coming on right now. Because the enemy didn't wait until David became king of Israel to try to strip his confidence. So he was rejected in his own household. See, the enemy starts at an early age trying to alter the blueprint that God Almighty had for you when he put you on planet Earth. Because when God put you on the planet, he put you here by divine design that you might accomplish your mission. Therefore, there were strategic voices of the enemy sent into your life at a young age, trying to talk you out of your intelligence, trying to make you believe that you were less than or you didn't fit. I know you're having a hard time saying amen right now because I'm hitting right where you're at. That's why your third grade teacher acted crazy. That's why your family rejected you because they were trying to strip the confidence that you were somebody. Therefore, the last place you need to get beat up is in the house of God. You need to be reminded 
brother John was saying, before he formed us, he knew us. In my mother's womb, he knew me. God had a plan and a design for me. And that if I would find my gift and my calling, and I would get close to God and get the confidence, I could begin to accomplish the very thing that God had for me. As I preach to you, there's not a person under the sound of my voice that doesn't have an assignment. There's not a person under the sound of my voice that doesn't have a gift and a calling with your name on it. But could it be that your confidence has been stripped to the point that even though it's saying, you feel unworthy to walk in it? I had a young preacher come to me one time, and I told him what a preacher told me. He came to me and he said, Barry, he said, I won't preach. He said, but every time I get up there, he said, I hear voices that tell me I'm unworthy. I hear voices that remind me of stuff in my past. He said, every time. And I looked at him and I said, I hear those same voices. And he said, well, what do you do? I said, I choose to ignore them. <laughs> I'm going to give somebody a license to stand on the God of it and say, devil, I might have done what you said I did, but I ain't who you said I am. There'll always be that voice in the backdrop of your life trying to strip you of your confidence. What if you fail? What if you get up there and choke? What if you go forward? Uh, I would rather live my life and at the end of it say, oh, well, than what if. There are too many people that at the end of their life, they're thinking, what if I would have stepped out and done that? What if I would have seized that opportunity? I would rather live my life saying, oh, well, I got my nose busted a few times. Oh, well, I might not have won every time, but at least I tried. At the end of my days, I want to say, at least I swung at it. At least I gave it the best I had. I'm trying to stir somebody up and say, don't live your life with an old well. Live your life saying, I'm going forward. What if I talk to people? What if I what if I stepped out at that moment? What if I would have done that thing? David, the rejection he received from man, it pushed him into the presence of God. Your pain will either push you into the presence or will drive you from the presence. But your pain will take you somewhere. And you can choose to let the pain and the rejection that you went through in life make you find your place in God. And David, in his isolation, he found that he had a knack for praising God and changing his mood. See, that's why the enemy hates praise. Because it can alter your mood. It can alter the way you feel. And David found out when he didn't have nobody else to talk to, like that lonely man Joel was talking about. David watching those sheep on the backside of the desert, he could talk to God. And he found out when nobody else wanted to hear from him, God wanted to hear from him. And when his brothers didn't value his opinion, God loved to hear what he had to say. You ought to give God a praise if you know. God likes to talk. His pain and cultivated his gift. So much of a gifted man and woman of God. It did not come from seminary, but it came from pain that they used to put in the hand of God. And it cultivated what God had called them to do. God is such a God that he can take my pain and use it to push me into my purpose. And we come to the time of our text and King Saul was a man that God had elevated. The Bible even said that he had hidden himself among the stuff because he had such low self-esteem and such a low self-concept that he hid himself among the stuff. He, he was an humble man, but it went to the point uh, of, of a terrible weakness and character flow in his life because you find that even when Paul got elevated, it never fixed his insecurity. I want you to pause and think of that right now. $10 million won't fix an insecure spirit. Fame doesn't fix an insecure spirit. Elevation does not heal insecurity. Insecurity is only healed in the presence of God. I met famous people, and they're some of the most insecure jokers I've ever seen. I met people that everybody knows their name, and they're as insecure as a five-year-old little boy lost in a play playground. But I have met other people that their name that never may have never been in light. So, and nobody o'clock news, but they heard God tell them who they were, and they believed it, and they lay their head on their pillow at night, knowing they are somebody. I want you to know you are somebody. And so now you find Saul, that even though he's been elevated, he is still highly insecure. Highly insecure. And 
His insecurities and his irrational ways of thinking, they cause a lot of pain to come into his life. And the pain gets so great that he needs somebody to change the atmosphere. Did you know that the anointing on your life can change the atmosphere for somebody else? That when you walk in the presence of God, you can actually make bad people feel better. You can make depressed people leave feeling blessed. God wants there to be such an anointing on your life that people leave you feeling better than they did when they came. I can't get no help in here. But some of you had some grandmas like that. Some of you had some family members like that. That you can go to their house feeling like you want to lose it. And they can make you feel better. Is there anybody that's ever been in the presence of somebody that's anointed to make you feel better? You saw that gift today with Pastor Joe and Brother Mikey as they stood up just it began to ooze out of them. That gift to make you feel better. Saul found himself in a place where he said, I need somebody to make me feel better. I want, I'm going to be honest with you. I come to church because it makes me feel better. Uh -huh. I worship God because it makes me feel better. I read the word of God because it makes me feel better. Because I realize without him, I'm a hopeless case. Can't even get out of bed in the morning. But when I get him in my life, Saul said I need somebody to make me feel better. Have you ever needed somebody to make you feel better? And he said, go get me David because I heard he can make me feel better. I heard there's something on his life that can make me feel better. And David, this little unknown shepherd boy, the, the king's pain brings a platform to the gift that's in David. And David begins to play before the king. And as he plays before the king, the anointing on David's life begins to drive out the demonic influence of the, of the enemy. You've got to hear me right now. It's more than just spiritual aerobics when we're in here lifting our hands, praising God. What we are doing is we are committing warfare against all the lies the enemy has told us that week. We're not just raising our hands because somebody said so. We're raising our hands to remind the devil that no weapon formed against me. I need somebody right now. If you know your praise is powerful, I dare you to stand to your feet and try. the enemy. I know what it's like to be going through warfare in my mind. And all of a sudden that praise, it could just silence the devil. See, praise makes the enemy shut up. And if he's talking all the time, you ain't praising him enough. David was in a place where he didn't feel like praising. I mean, Saul was in a place where he didn't feel like praising. So he brought in somebody anointed. And this anointed man began to play the heart. And Saul's heart melted. Because in the presence of David, he felt good again. When you get around anointed people, that make you feel good again. When you get around people that have the hand of God on what drew me to Pastor Jack and Sister Don was the anointing on their life. It made me feel good. It made me feel like I mattered. It made me feel like I could go forward. And Saul's heart melted because he said, whatever's on that boy, it makes me feel better. It makes me feel like I can make it. It makes me feel like I could go forward. And he valued the gift that was in David. In fact, the Bible said that he had found favor in his sight. He loved David. I read it to you in chapter 16. But the tragedy is by the time chapter 16 had rolled over into chapter 18, he called for David again. The boy that made him feel better. The boy who had an assignment to bless Saul. Can I go here? And when he goes to Saul this time, the Bible says Saul had a spear in his hand. Have you ever had to minister to somebody that was getting ready to cut you? Have you ever had to be good to somebody and all the while you knew in their back pocket they were plotting your demise? He was sent as at other times to minister to Saul. And even with the javelin in Saul's hand, David began to play. Here's what I found out about the anointing. God will cause you to bless them even when they're plotting your demise. God will cause you to stand up and give him glory even when you got people coming against you. And David said you can hold the javelin, but I'm going to praise God anyhow. You want to give God a praise if you got some enemies, but you say I'm going to keep on. You got people talking about you, but you say I'm going to keep going. You got people walking away, but you say hey, that's for me and my house. 
in his hand. David said, I won't play anyway. And I just come to tell the devil I'm going to preach anyway. Even with the javelin in his hand, David begins to play under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And this time, instead of Saul letting it soothe him, Saul takes that javelin, Michelle, and he throws it at a boy he loves. Here's what I found out about unhealthy people. Unhealthy people can love you and hurt you at the same time. When the enemy gets you in a toxic relationship, I know people that are in love with somebody, but at the same time they hurt that person that they love. When somebody is twisted inwardly, they will hurt outwardly. Uh, Ronnie Ward told me this. He said, hurting people hurt people. And even though Saul was king of Israel and had everything, and David, the little shepherd boy, had basically nothing, Saul was jealous of David because I have seen people get a spirit of jealousy. They got the big house, they on the big side of town, got everything life could offer them, but they see the presence in somebody else's life, and instead of getting it for themselves, they get jealous of you, and you're going to hear me right now. See, some of you got enemies, and you say, why do they hate I don't have this going on. I don't have that going on. It's because the enemy senses something in you that they don't have. And sometimes people that love you can hurt you. What do you do when the people you were anointed to help begin to hurt you? What do you do when the family that you love with everything in you begins to turn their back on you? What do you do when the kids God gave you begin to come against you? What do you do when the place God puts you begins to turn its back on you? What do you do when the thing you were anointed to heal tries to kill you? What do you do when the people you were called to sing to, Charlie, begin to come against you? What do you do, Mary, when the people you were called to preach to, the people you were assigned to help, begin to come against you? David, his assignment began to attack him. Here's what I've seen the trick of the enemy chase. The enemy will try to wound you by the very ones you've been called to heal. To get you to lose confidence, to get you to lose hope, and to get you to give up on God. David went through this with Saul time after time after time. And I don't care how anointed you are and how big a Bible you pack and how much you pray in tongues, when you keep getting hurt by the people you love, it will take something out of you. Oh, I know you're too full of God. I need some honest people. Have you ever been hurt by somebody you loved? Have you ever been laid down by somebody you want to lay down your life for? After a while, it'll take something out of you. I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care how much you love God. You keep getting hurt by the people you love, and it'll strip some confidence out of you. It'll take something out of you. And it don't happen overnight. Chapter 16 is good. Chapter 18 it really begins. But by the time you get to 1 Samuel 27 verse 1, here's what happens. And David said in his heart, I shall now one day perish by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines and Saul shall despair of me and to see any more of my life on the coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. David said, I quit. I get up. Am I preaching to anybody that you may be here this morning? But deep down, you've given up. You've given up on some things God promised you. You've given up on some things God told you. And you're not giving up because the enemy popped out from under your bed with a pitchfork. But it was people you loved. People you cared for. David said, prophet, Zechariah prophesied, I was wounded in the house of my friend. It was the people Jesus loved. The crucified. In Zechariah, he prophesied, I was wounded in the house of my friend. David, in the book of Psalms, he said, if it would have been my adversary, I could have handled it. He said, but it was not my adversary, it was my acquaintance. And 
and somebody that I used to worship God with. It's a good way of saying this right here. You don't care what some joker five states over says about you because they don't know you. But the people that you serve God with, the people that you prayed for and prayed with, their opinion does matter to you at some level. Therefore, the enemy says, if I can wound them in that area, I can get them to give up on God. And Joel, just let me go ahead and help you. It don't matter whoever comes against you in ministry, baby. They can't touch that anointing on your mouth. You square them shoulders back. You set that face like a flint. And you go in the confidence of the Holy Ghost. What do you do? When your assignment attacks you. What do you do? The shepherd, what's he do with the sheep? When the very sheep he's trying to feed by it. Me and Carlene were in a tough time 10 years ago. And a man came up to us and uh, he said, sometimes sheep bite. And sometimes the reality of life is the people you love are going to hurt you. Some of you are in here today because your family has hurt you. People you love, a husband, a wife, a spouse. People that love you and you have a hard time. My mind always has a hard time thinking, how can you love me and hurt me at the same time? And here's what I found out. When people do that, it's nothing to do with you and everything to do with what's going on with them. I'm trying to let somebody off the hook right now because you keep looking in the mirror what's wrong with you. It ain't wrong with you when somebody is that uh, against you and that determined to destroy you. It's because there's something that is twisted in their life and until it gets healed, they're going to continue to do the same. You're not the problem. But how many people do we know that walk around in life feel like they're the problem? Trying to change because somebody don't like the way, the way you dress, the way you look, the way you act. Don't alter who you are because somebody else can't accept it. I have 40, get ready to turn 44. I'm just determined I'm going to be who I is. I'm going to dress how I want to dress. I'm going to act how I'm free from worrying about pleasing religious nuts because it's always going to be too long or it's always going to be too short. So here's the deal. For the rest of my life, I'm just going to be me and everybody Have permission to be you. You didn't have to worry. Well, what's this one going to think? The most powerful people I know are people that say, I'm me and I'm good with you. The enemy tries to make you uncomfortable in your own skin. The enemy tries to get you to worry about the javelin somebody's going to throw at you if you step out and do what God called you to do. And by chapter 27, David said, I quit. I give up. I can't take it no more. And I'm preaching to people I know this by the Holy Ghost that you are on that verge. You're standing at the edge and you're thinking, I quit. I can't take it no more. It ain't never going to get any better. I want to tell you something. It always gets darkest right before breakthrough. David began to take a downward spiral. He joined himself to the very king, Asius, that wanted to destroy Israel. David mounted his horses in a city. 600 mighty men, and he said, I hate them people too. That's in your Bibles. David joined the battle, and he was going to fight against Israel. He was going to kill the very people he had been anointed to heal. He was going to kill the very people he had been anointed to lead. And right before the battle, God stirred up a disturbance between Asius' army and King David. And they begin to doubt David. They said, David is the one that slew Goliath. David was the chief enemy of the Philistines. David was the greatest champion. And now we believe David's going to help us kill Israel. And they begin to doubt David. So they kicked David out and his 600 mighty men. Now David's going back to Ziklag and said, everywhere I go, I get rejected. Why did that door get shut? Let me help you. Sometimes God has to close the door because a better one's getting ready to open. And if you walk through that door you're wanting to walk through, you're going to miss the door God had for you. I'd rather walk through a God door any day of my life. Let me help you with something. Big doors swing on small hinges. Sometimes you miss the big door God's getting ready to open for you because you don't like the small hinge that's hanging on. 
Sometimes you miss the big thing God's going to do because you despise the day of small beginnings. Every big thing I know in life started small. Every great thing I have today started small. My marriage started small. I started with me and Myrtle Beach running into a blonde headed girl and saying hi. And here 21 years later, two kids later, and a church later, we're still here because big doors open on small hinges. That's why the Bible said you'll miss God if you despise the day of small beginnings. We've got to teach this generation sometimes you've got to start small. Man, I feel so just coming out of me that it, what I, God's pulling to that. And so now David, he gives up. He says, Asus has rejected me. Saul, the man I love, has rejected me. Israel has turned their back on me. At least I'll go to Ziklag, my makeshift place. But as they top over the hill, Ziklag is burning. What do you do when it seems like everything you touch is going to pot? David looks and they've stolen the women and the children. David's heart drops because he says, my God, how did my life get here? Could that be where you are today? How did my life get here? Have you let pain push you in the wrong direction? And David said, well, at least I still got my boys behind me. And he looks, Joe, and the 600 men he was anointed to lead were saying, let's kill him. The worst thing you can do to a leader is give up on him. The worst thing you can do to a preacher, a man of God, a woman of God, somebody assigned over you, is quit believing God's hand is on their life. Because the minute you do that, you take their power to help you out of the equation. And now David, his mind races back. He says, I've got nobody. My dad ain't with me. My friends ain't with me. My wife has been stripping from me. Everything is going. And now my 600 guys I thought would never leave me. Now they're talking about killing me. And David's memory goes back to the little shepherd boy that nobody knew his name, but God was always there for him. And David said, you may not be here for me, but I know somebody I can talk to. And David put on the ephod of praise. And he said, there's somebody that's never turned their back on me. I'm going to go talk to him. And David walked up that mountain. I feel the Holy Ghost. And the Bible said, he began to encourage himself in the Lord. i got to tell some every now and then, you got to preach to yourself. Every now and then, you got to tell yourself to get up. Every now and then, you got to say, I will live and not die. Have you ever had to encourage yourself? David would have been like the modern prophet. David would have died that day because he wouldn't have known what to do. But David said, I've been here before. I've been alone before. I've had nobody before. I know what that's like. I know where I can go. Do you know where you can go when you can't even talk to family about what's going on? The Bible said, David, Encourage himself. The best sermons I've ever preached you'll never hear. Because I preached them to me going down the road saying don't give up. <laughs> the most powerful sermon you'll preach in a time of pain is what you tell yourself. Because your self-talk will either build you up or it will destroy you. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not so important what everybody else is saying in your moment of pain. It's important what are you saying. The Bible said David encouraged himself. I believe he began to remind himself of those old scriptures that he wrote when nobody knew his name. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I believe he referred to Psalms 91 and said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, he shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my rock, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. There shall no evil befall me, neither shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. For the Lord shall give his angels charge over me, and though a thousand may fall on my left hand, and ten thousand have my right, it shall not come nigh me. Only with my eyes shall I look and behold the reward of the wicked. David began to say, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in enough he meditate day and night, for he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of the living water. And David went up that mountain fell in one way, but it came down that mountain. How do you want to give God I feel a 
know is on his hillside of despair, his arch enemy Saul was on another hillside, Moose, died. And then just three days later, he would be anointed king of Judah. Hear me now. His worst day and his greatest day were only three days apart. Rewind our history 2,000 years ago. The darkest day humanity knew was when Jesus died. But the brightest day came three days later when the storm was rolled away and the man kept getting captain. I just want you to know you are closer than you have ever been. You are closer than you have ever been. I just want you to put your hands to the Lord right now. Because if it's dark and you feel like giving up, that just means you're almost there. If you felt more like quitting than you've ever felt, if you've cried more tears than you've ever cried, if you've looked up into heaven and felt like saying, why? More than ever. The worst day and the best day were three days apart. That's how close you are. My man Chase, he was having a great game Friday night. He was sweating. He was, he, I mean, he played. I walked over to Chase on the sidelines. I just felt led. And I wrapped my arms around him. And I said, Chase, I think you got one more in you. You got another touchdown in you? And Chase, he's so old. He said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. A few plays later, my man outran the fastest player in the state of West Virginia for the touchdown. I just come to tell you, your best is still in you. It's still there. Encourage yourself in the Lord your God, and you shall see it come to pass. I want to pray for you, and I'm going to open these altars. Spirit of the living God, for everybody, it's felt like giving up. For everybody that's just been on the verge of saying, I can't take more pain, I can't take more struggle. For everybody that's just weary, speaking encouragement to their spirit. Encouragement to their heart. For everybody that's been deemed unworthy by the enemy. For everybody that's felt like just hanging their head in shame because of a tormenting lie of the enemy. I speak encouragement to that person. And I just feel led to tell you that God's not done with you. That if He was done with you, you wouldn't be here. The very fact to give you grace to come into service today was God's confirmation that He wanted to encourage you and let you know that the rest of your life can be the best of your life. If you're in here today and you say, Pastor, I'm wounded, I'm struggling, I'm bleeding, but nobody can see it. I'm crying, but nobody hears. I had to be strong for others when I felt like I was collapsing myself. This is your day. If that's you, would you step out of that seat right now and just come up here to this old fashioned altar? Because I sense God just want to restore some people that you just don't emerge. You say, I needed some encouragement today. I needed some help today. I want you to step out of your seat right now. The best birthday present you can give me is obey God concerning your life. Because I know he's talking to some people right now. I dare you to step out of your seat. I want to pray for you. I want you to get what you need off of God today. I'm going to wait on you because I know you're here. I know you're in here. I know you're here. I want you to give them a hand clap as they come and encourage them that you understand what it feels like. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. There are others right now. Just I want you to know we've all been there. We've all felt like giving up. I felt like giving up a few times. Everybody's felt like giving up. But God always sends somebody to encourage you. There's others in here today, darkest, darkest season of your life. And you want help so bad, but you don't know what to do. I'll tell you what you do. You respond to the Spirit of God. When God begins to tug on you, you come. When God begins to tug on you, you come. And right now, He is tugging on you. God brought you to this place because you're in a desperate place in your life. And you say, I need God to help me. I dare you. Step out of your seat right now. Come to this old-fashioned altar. Right? I'm going to keep on fishing. 
because I know I'm dealing with some people that have been going through hell. Get one more time. I want you to put those hands together. Let them know it is safe in this place. It is safe in this place. No judgment. No condemnation. God brought you here to be good to you. I dare you. Step out. Step out. Step out. They were here bowed. They were out closed. It's small to workers together. I'm Jennifer, Nikki, and Tracy. My sister, Missy. God bless you, sweetie. And I just got to baptize her last week. Would you give her a hand clap? Hallelujah. Oh, there's commas. The Spirit of God is moving. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in here, more altar workers come. I sense, I sense an oil wanting to flow in this place. If you're in here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, 2,000 years ago, the ultimate price was paid for you. The door was swung wide open. The veil was rent. He did for you what you could never do for yourself. He got you access into the presence of God. I don't care what you've done or where you've been. The blood of Jesus is greater than the blood of Adam. The free gift of salvation was purchased for you by Jesus 2,000 years ago. If you're in here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, please come up to this altar as we pray and let us lead you in the prayer. Worship the Lord as Charlie sings this anointed song.